Thank you, Abigail. Did you guys like that last song? Um, Sarah's not going to tell you this, but she wrote that. Um, and we are incredibly blessed to have people who are willing to use their gifts for God's glory and to share that with us. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Uh, my name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and uh, I want to welcome you here. I am so excited that you are here. Um, let me highlight a couple of things that are going on. When you walked in, you should have received something that looked like this. And if you're a guest, these are especially helpful for you because it kind of explains to you um, how to get in touch with us, a little bit about what's going on in the church, and um, just good thing for you to have. If you want more information about what's going on in the life of the church, and that's anything from kids' programs to winter showers happening and things like that, um, you can either find that on our phone app or just go to the community life desk that's to my right in the lobby and you can pick up a calendar that has all that information on it and so forth and would love for you to have that. But let me just quickly remind you of a couple of things. We have a congregational meeting happening today at four o'clock right in here. Uh, we try to have two of those a year and uh, we've got one scheduled for today. So please join us for that for an update on what's going on in the life of the church. We have a baptism that's going on in two weeks, and it would help if you want to be baptized or have a child who wants to be baptized, if you could let us know uh, by tomorrow, and then we'll start contacting folks and arranging for all the details of that. Also, if you look at the uh, information on here, you're going to see we have information about how you can help participate in worship. We need some help with the video tech team, uh, and we need some help with the mini fairs that are coming up. And also, don't forget about our Christmas for our missionaries. We need those gifts back by next Sunday. Um, and it's time for the selection of new trustees, and you're going to be seeing information about that coming soon, so keep an eye open for that. So, one last thing. Tiffany Owens snagged me this morning and said, hey, I'm going to Ethiopia on Wednesday. And she is going to be uh, doing a short-term missions trip there. And I'm really excited. This is with an organization she's traveled with before. And if she keeps doing this, she's going to be in charge. Um, and uh, uh, But it's an incredible opportunity for her to share the gospel with people um, in a very uncomfortable situation. So would you just join me in prayer real quick and praying for Tiffany? So, Father, thank you so much that you have blessed us with people like Tiffany who are willing to take risks to serve you. Lord, thank you that you invite all of us to participate in your work, in your ministry that you are doing, Lord. We ask especially for Tiffany this morning that you would keep her safe as she travels, keep her safe as she ministers, work through her in powerful ways, Lord, to impact lives. And for her husband, Chris, and for the kids, Lord, we ask that you would keep them sane while Tiffany is away and uh, bring her back to us and to her family safely. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tiffany, just wave real quick so people see where you are. And if you want to find out more about what she's doing there, uh, you can connect with her after the service. I want to keep reminding us to reflect on what it is that we do here each Sunday morning, right? It's easy to think that we come here, and if we get our hearts right with God, then God is going to show up. You hear that sort of thinking when people say things like, God, we invite you here. That's actually not quite right. Really, a better way of thinking about that is that God brings us together. He is the one who invites us to join him and to join with all of the heavens in worship and proclaiming his name. You see, that first way of thinking about worship, that we have to get ourselves right and then God joins us, really makes it all about us. The focus becomes on how good we are or how good we're not. And that second way of thinking about worship really emphasizes who God is and what he's doing. And then we respond. 
Underneath that first way of thinking about worship is a way of thinking about relating to God that is everywhere in our culture and including in our churches. And the idea is that God is waiting for us to get things right, and then he'll enter into a relationship with us. This morning's passage that Abigail read for us is going to turn that thinking on its head. It shows the reality that we cannot get things right, but God still calls us to him. We're continuing our series in Micah. Last week, I introduced the three cycles of bad news and good news that you see in Micah. Micah 1 starts with God coming to judge the people. Chapter 2 explains why. They were greedy. They were corrupt. But the end of chapter 2 ends the first cycle with a word of hope. There is going to be redemption and restoration. Chapter 3 starts the second cycle. It gives more judgment. This time, the evidence, the reason for their judgment is because of their desire for power and their idolatry and misuse of power. But last week, we started the hope part of the third cycle, or second cycle. And that is also where we're going to be this morning. Last week, we looked at the distant future and the promise of a final eternal rebuilding of God's people. This week and next week, the message of hope continues as Micah outlines the journey between where they are and that hope that they wait for. Starting in Micah 4, 6, Micah shows the journey of hope beginning. And the beginning of the journey of hope always starts in woundedness and suffering. And that's what we're going to see today in today's passage. We're going to start with the journey of hope beginning in woundedness, and that's the first paragraph of this passage, which is verses 6 through 8. Now remember, uh, we saw this last week in Micah 4, 1 through 4. Micah takes us to the far future, but then in verse 5, he steps back and he says, because of the future that is ahead of you, this is how you should live today, and so he talks about the present. But if you notice in Micah 4, 6, He talks about in that day again. So he's talking about the future one more time. He keeps changing his time references. And Micah describes the raw material, the people that God is going to use to build his nation, his people. And the point of 4, 6 through 8 is that these people are in bad shape. In verse 6, he describes them as lame and driven away. They are afflicted. And the word that's translated afflicted has the idea of being disciplined. So Mike is alluding to the reason that they ended up in exile, the reason they ended up lame and driven away. They had turned their backs on God. And God is going to get their attention and bring them back to him. In verse 7, he repeats this idea, saying again that they are lame and that they are cast off. And in verse 8, he has this really strange phrase, they are a tower of the flock. You see, the once proud city of Jerusalem has been reduced to a little watchtower in some field on some hill. The people in verses 6 through 8 have felt the effects of losing a war. and They have felt the effects of being carried away in exile. They are a defeated people. We don't think much about what it's like to lose a war. That's not really part of our culture in this country. But in their day, that was a big deal. And you see, in their day, the enemy king wasn't just trying to defeat your nation's army. He was trying to crush your spirit. And so the nation that Israel, or the Jews were facing, Assyria, They didn't just want to take this conquered nation into exile into Assyria. What they wanted to do was to scatter the people throughout all of Assyria's conquered territories. And then they would take other people that they would conquer, and they would relocate them back to the Jews' uh, area and location. And the idea was to mix all these people together. And the reason that you did that is because if you could mix all the people together, it became almost impossible for any particular nation to unify, to come together, and to rebel against their conquered nation. 
An enemy would also destroy the cities that they captivated, especially the protective walls that surrounded the cities. Those walls wouldn't be rebuilt without the permission of the victorious king. Why? It's not just because the walls rebuilt the, the, protected the city. It's because the walls symbolized something. The walls were the symbol that your city, that your people had a fighting chance. And a conquering king would want to make sure they constantly sent the picture. You don't have a chance. You have been completely defeated. I remember as a kid, I have no idea what movie this was. It's black and white. But I saw this movie that was about the Civil War. And at the end of the movie, you see a line of people coming home after the war. And these people are soldiers who are on crutches. They are being carried on stretchers. Every one of them is wounded and in pain. And what they come home to is a picture of utter destruction. Homes have been burned to the ground. Places of business, places of farming have been completely destroyed. And that's the picture that you have here. These are people who have been utterly and completely destroyed. I don't know if you know this, um, but sometimes if you try hard enough, you can get guys to talk about sports. Not all guys, but a lot of guys. And if you really try hard enough, you can get them to watch ESPN, or especially sports talk radio. Now, about every other day on sports talk radio, there is a particular question that comes up because they have nothing else to talk about. And so the question is, if you could build your team around one person, who would it be? Now, if you're talking football, for example, they're almost always, the callers are going to pick, you know, the top quarterback that's winning. So interestingly, by the way, that you will notice that the Cowboys quarterback, Dak Prescott, has been strangely absent from these conversations the past couple of years. Um, not my fault. Um, See, when people think about building a winning team, they think about building around a core of stars, people who are winning, people who are succeeding. The people that God brings together to build his nation are radically different. They are broken in every way imaginable. They are physically wounded. Their spirits are crushed. The nation has been humiliated. These are the people that God is going to use to rebuild his nation. You see, if they'd had talk radio in that day and they were to ask the question, who's the one person you'd want to build a nation around, the names that would come up would be, would be the people from the cultural elite, the wealthy, the powerful, the influential, the military leaders. God builds his people out of the broken. He did that then and he does it today. See, if we accept the culture's belief that God is looking for the people who have it together, we will always be afraid to admit to ourselves, to others, and to God that deep down we struggle with sin. And we live with the constant pressure to prove to ourselves and others that we are good enough. That, by the way, historically, is why churches always did public confession like we did this morning. It was to send a message of reminder that all of us walk in here as sinners and all of us walk in here and meet God's grace. Had a very interesting conversation with someone last night, someone I've been building a relationship for a couple of years now. She is someone who, um, she struggles with a sin that church culture thinks is particularly bad and a lot worse than other sins. And she asked me last night if she could visit FBC. She wanted to know how would she be treated. 
Gut check question, huh? How do we treat sinners? See, answering that question comes down to how you see yourself. If someone who struggles with promiscuity or substance abuse or same-sex attraction walks through our doors, how are you going to react? Some people will want them to go away because they don't fit here. Other people are going to pat themselves on the back for being the kind of church that ministers and cares for people like that. And guess what? Both of those reactions are wrong. Both reactions have the same problem. They treat that person like a special class of sinner. Guess what? You are in a room full of sinners. And you are one of them. You are in a room full of people who struggle with arrogance, lust, self-centeredness, lying, and promiscuity, and same self-attraction, and substance abuse. One of the things that's been amazing to me is almost every week for the last five or six weeks, I have met someone who is here who had never or hardly ever been in a church in their lives. And they're asking the question, how will you accept me? And how we accept them has a lot to do with how we see ourselves. Do we see ourselves wounded, sinful people? Or do we see ourselves as people who fundamentally have it together? The journey to hope begins in woundedness because that keeps us from underestimating how completely dependent we are on God's work in our lives. The same is true with others, with the other starting place on the journey to hope. What the rest of the passage shows us is that the journey to hope begins in suffering. And Micah brings us out by turning our attention to their present day by saying four different things that are going on now. The first now statements in verse 9, Micah tells them that now they are in agony. Verse 9 describes the people as crying out in agonizing pain, a woman who is in labor. Remember, this is way before modern medicine. Micah has this picture of someone who is crying out in extreme physical pain and whose life is absolutely in danger. And the reason that they are crying out like this is because they do not have leadership. The king that they had at the time wasn't leading them well, and the people had forgotten that God was their ultimate leader. Verse 10 carries on that same theme in the first part of the verse. Here's the very first commandment in this entire section. Micah tells them, writhe and groan in agony like a woman who is in labor. The first thing that's true of their situation now is that they are in agony. As verse 10 continues, it emphasizes the second thing that's true about their present situation. They face defeat. This is saying that they will be taken from the safety and comfort of the city where they lived to some unknown, less safe, less comfortable, random field they don't know where. It's interesting that it references Babylon. Babylon was around then, but Babylon was not the power that they would become. And so people aren't sure, why do they talk about Babylon here? It's really one of two reasons. Either because it's emphasizing that these people are going to go everywhere, or it's emphasizing how long these people are going to be defeated. Either way, the point is, these people are going to be utterly, utterly defeated. Verse 11 introduces the third now statement. Now they face humiliation. This is expanding Micah's description of the defeat that they are facing. The enemies are anticipating gloating over the people. So the image that's here is a woman who has been assaulted, and then she is paraded in front of others, and she's being laughed at. It is utter, complete humiliation. 
chapter 5, 1 has the final now statement. Now they are to prepare for conflict. This is the final command in the passage. Muster your troops. Get ready for battle. Daughter of troops probably means that they are under oppression of other troops. Certainly the verse describes them as under siege. The point is the enemy has laid siege to them and is oppressing them and even says that they strike the jaw of the ruler of Israel. That's a way of saying they completely have contempt for Israel's king and Israel's people. Micah describes their present situation as being in agony, being defeated, humiliated, and preparing for conflict, a conflict that they are going to lose. But God is going to use all of that to build his people. A lot of people think that life with God is a Yeti cooler life. They think that life with God is getting in one of those amazing Yeti coolers and being insulated from the heat of the outside world. Right? That thinking shows up when we tell people that they should become a Christian because then their relationships will be better. Then they'll be more successful at work or other ways that life is going to be happy for them. This is not Micah's picture. Here's the reality. Christians still lose jobs unfairly. Christians get terminal diseases. Christians have relationships blow up in their face. That's because we live in a sinful, broken world. Micah's promise is that God will use the suffering that we experience to shape his people. The truly abundant life is a life lived in a growing relationship with God, no matter what we are experiencing in the world. The abundant life is not a life without suffering. It is a life with God through suffering. It is a life where God redeems every painful moment and draws us to him. The journey of hope is not lived in a Yeti cooler, insulated, protected from the world. It is a life that is limping as wounded people, wounded by our own sinfulness, limping through a sinful, fallen world. But we do not limp alone. We limp on this journey, supported and sustained by God's grace. We see God's grace at work. As we look at this passage through a little bit of a different lens, If we look at this passage and pay attention to what it says the people do and then what it says that God does. What does it say that we do or the people do? Micah tells the people to do three things. One of them is in the far future, but two of them he wants them to do right now. As we saw in verse 10, he wants them to writhe and groan because they are in agony. This is something that they're supposed to do right now. Now, if you think about it, what an incredibly bizarre statement. When I was six years old and my left knee became intimately acquainted with the sprinkler head, nobody, nobody had to tell me to writhe and groan in pain. I suspect that no one has ever had to tell a woman in labor to writhe and groan in pain. It just happens. You don't have to command someone in pain to act like they're in pain. But Micah did. See, the problem was that Micah's audience was acting like nothing was wrong. Micah wants them to react appropriately to the reality of their situation. They are in crisis that they can't fix, and they need to acknowledge it. Verse 13 is a command to arise and thresh. That's actually referring to something in the future when the Lord is going to deliver them. They are to engage as a part of that delivery process. It says that they are to go out and battle their enemies, but it's interesting that in 5.1, he gives a very similar command, and it's a command to prepare for battle, and he wants them to do this now. 
The people need to gather the resources that they have now and to be prepared. There are two things that Micah wants his audience to do now. First, writhe and groan, which means face the reality of the situation that you are in and that it is desperate and there is nothing you can do about it. Second, muster your troops, which simply means to gather the resources you have and get ready to face the enemy, even though there is no way that they can win. This is a desperate situation. And that takes us to what God does. You see this starting in verse 6. If you look at verse 6 chronologically, here's what's going on. The first thing God did was discipline his people. He promises that he will assemble the wounded. So he is saying that God is going to get the attention of the people who have turned their back on him. And once he has it, he is going to bring them home. Verse 7 shows God rebuilding the wounded into a strong nation. Jerusalem and the temple have been restored. The Lord will be their true king forever. Once the people have been assembled by God, God is going to lead them, guide them, protect them, oversee them forever. Verse 10, God says that he will rescue and redeem his people. Even as the enemy attacks, God already has plans for how he will save his people. And the point of verse 13, which sounds so strange with horns and hooves, is really saying that when the time comes to execute the plan and deliver his people, God is going to make his people like a powerful, powerful bull that just tramples over his enemies like his enemies are little pieces of grain. Here's what Micah was saying to the people. Gather all the resources that you have. Face the crisis that's coming. But grieve over the reality that what you have isn't enough. Take everything you have. Use it to the best that you can. But you're going to get wiped out. And that should break your hearts. But... But God is going to work, and he is going to accomplish what they cannot accomplish on their own. And that is the definition of grace. And that is the basis of their hope. And it is exactly what God does for us as well. The definition of grace is God's work in you to accomplish what you cannot accomplish on your own. If this understanding of grace sinks into you, I promise it will change your life. Our culture thinks that, thinks that God wants us to be good people and then he will accept us. And that thinking creeps into the church. And that is why we tell ourselves that if we blow it, God must not want us. That's why we look down on someone else because of their struggles but minimize our own. That's why we think that if we are going through a hard time, God must be mad at us. It's why we can't be honest with ourselves or others that we struggle at deep levels to do what is right and pleasing God, and we don't have our act together. Underneath all of that is the false belief that it is up to us to gather our resources and overcome the woundedness of being broken and sinful people, living and suffering in a broken and sinful world. The message of Micah to us today, really the message of the entire Bible, is that we cannot, on our own, overcome our own brokenness and the brokenness of this world. The journey to hope begins in woundedness and suffering because that is our reality. As much as we want to deny it and avoid it and think we can overcome it, the journey of hope begins with the confession that we cannot make this journey on our own. But it also begins with the assurance that we aren't asked to. You cannot enter a right relationship with God through your own efforts and resources. It is impossible. You cannot live in right relationship with God through your own efforts and resources. Instead, God's, God works in you to accomplish what you cannot. 
when we stop trying to earn God's acceptance by being good enough for him and accept that the only way to gain God's acceptance is to receive his forgiveness because of Jesus' death on the cross. That is when God works in us to give us the rightness with God that we want. And that pattern doesn't change after we enter a relationship with God. I have spent most of my life trying to impress God. If I did something like go on a short-term mission trip to Ethiopia, I would think to myself, surely God's got to be happy with me today. I've earned it. I sinned, if I committed one of the big sins especially, then I would just curl up in shame and fear. Micah's word is, you can't think that way. That thinking is living as if it's possible for you to be good enough for God. You are wounded and living in a world of suffering. When you really embrace that truth, when you really embrace the truth that you are broken and fallen, you will give up the hopeless, stressful battle to impress God, and you'll just accept his grace. God's people are built by God's efforts, not ours. Our situation on our own is absolutely dire. We are deeply wounded people who live in a broken world marked by suffering. On our own, there is nothing that we can do about it. And so what we need to do is embrace God's grace as the beginning of the journey of hope. And only then can we walk that journey well? And that's the point. It's the point of the passage. It's the point of the message. The journey of hope begins with grace for the defeated. Because the journey of hope begins in the woundedness of our sin, in the suffering of living in a fallen world, it is clear that God always gets all the credit for our rescue. And my prayer for us today is that the Holy Spirit will melt away that piece of us that is trying so hard to impress God and to impress one another and that lives in fear that we won't. So how do we respond to this? Suggested four ways. First way, always I like to suggest prayer. It is the Holy Spirit that drives the truth into us that we are sinful, fallen people completely dependent upon God's grace. And so go to the Holy Spirit and say, help me to understand that at the deepest level. As I try to say each week, we cannot live this life alone. We need people around us. As I had someone on staff do for me, even this past week where they came to me and said, I need to make you aware of an area where you are hurting yourself and you are hurting other people. That's how we grow in God's grace. So discuss with other people. Use the discussion questions as opportunities to enter into life-changing conversation. Each week I want to challenge you to study what, what the passage says about who God is. Take some time. Look at... at uh, four, six through five, one, and ask the question, what does it say about God? And then guess what? You are surrounded by wounded people suffering in a fallen world. Could you take some time this week and just send someone a note? Email, text, handwritten, whatever. Just letting them know that they are not alone on this journey of grace. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. The prayer team is here for that same reason as well. We want to pray for you, stand with you. As you go on this journey, as we limp along as sinful, fallen creatures, 
in a fallen and broken world. We are here to pray with you, help you any way that we can. But boy, especially if you do not know this God of grace, do we want to introduce you to him. Would you stand with me so we can close in prayer? Father, we come before you and we confess that we are sinful people, far more sinful than we care to admit, admit to ourselves, let alone to anyone else, let alone to you. But we are. And we struggle with the reality of living in a painful broken world filled with suffering. But Lord, this is where you invite us to begin the journey of hope. It is the only place we can begin the journey of hope because it is in this place that we truly encounter your grace. And we thank you that your grace is there for us to be encountered. Lord, help us to live in light of our reality but especially the reality of your grace for us and help us to live that out this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So here is who your God is. Your God is the God who takes broken, wounded, sinful people living and suffering in a broken world. And he says, my grace is enough for you. I will sustain you and shape you. Go here from here, knowing that that grace goes with you and that there are a whole bunch of people around you who need to hear about it. You are dismissed. <laughs>